In our last lesson, we learned about the flesh. It's so necessary for you to understand about the flesh. The scripture says that in our flesh dwells no good thing. The day that live after the flesh will die or be severed from God. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus, our Lord himself, said, The flesh profits nothing. Paul confesses in this seventh chapter of Romans that with my flesh I serve the law of sin. I then, for one, want to know about the flesh so that I can avoid it and avoid its ensnaring power upon my person. Actually, consistency is a divine trait and is woven into all creation. God is absolutely consistent. With Him is no variableness nor shadow of turning, the Scripture says. This thumbprint of deity, thumbprint of consistency, is stamped indelibly upon creation, which of course has enabled the scientist to classify knowledge and to go about his studies in a methodical and orderly way. In creation, consistency permits classification of knowledge. And anywhere and everywhere, disruption or inconsistency occurs in nature, it is considered abnormal. Now actually, God's chief creation is man. Made in the image of God, he has a divine imprint upon his soul that is infinitely greater and more precise than that upon creation. And because of this condition, man cannot accustom himself to disruption and disorder and interruption and a lack of consistency. He yearns for consistency, for the lack of interruption, for the lack of inconsistency. Whether in the religious world, the scholastic world, or just the world of natural concourse among human beings, the development of habits, the development of routines, the development of religious liturgies and procedures are nothing more than an attempt to establish consistency, something that's always the same. In heathen religions, there's a quest for consistency, a quest for a tranquil eternity where there'll be no interruptions, no turning aside, no inconsistencies. The whole world of humanity, the entire race, yearns for consistency and is discontent, discontent with disruption. In the drug culture, you have an attempt to escape conflict because man and his basic and fundamental nature does not find conflict tasteful, does not want it. And if I may add this, in Christendom's legalistic camp, by that I mean the camp that depends upon procedures and methods to get men to heaven, we have nothing more than an emulation of consistency, an attempt to arrive at consistency without faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In this particular lesson, we want to touch upon a very sensitive subject. Sensitive not because it's obnoxious or repulsive, but sensitive because it's so critical. Uncontrolled doing. Doing things you don't want to do. Not doing things you want to do. Now here the word of the Lord is found in Romans the seventh chapter in verse 15, very precise language. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that I do. What is Paul saying? He's saying that some things I do, I do not consent to them. I do not want to do them. The things I do, remember he's talking about his thought life, about the warfare within. I do not condone what is occurring in my own mind and in my own spirit. I do not condone it. And what I hate, thoughts that are repulsive to me, that I want to shun, I find them occurring in my mind. Uncontrolled doing. Verse 19 of Romans 7. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would, which I would not, that I do. Here again, Paul affirms that there are things occurring in him. He's not talking about expressions such as adultery, fornication, theft, murder. He's talking about things that occur inside of him. There are things that occur in me that I hate. And there are things that I want to occur in me that don't. 
Are you able to identify with that? Do you know what that's about? Again in verse 24, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I hate this condition, Paul says. I'm feeling the tug of contrary forces, being pulled in opposite directions, having thoughts course through my mind that are personally repulsive, wretched man that I am. Would God, I did not have to contend with this condition. Uncontrolled doing. Now let's set the stage for this situation. Because it does not make sense that this condition exists, not in view of what the Scriptures have to say about our status in Christ Jesus. At least not unless you're informed of these truths. In Christ Jesus we actually become kings and priests to God. Rulers, dominating figures. We begin to fulfill the role that God had for Adam of old. He created him and wanted him to have dominion over all the creation. We have been in Christ Jesus made for dominion. It is said in Revelation, the first chapter and verse 6, that Jesus Christ, the Prince of the kings of the earth, has washed us from our sins in His blood and made us kings and priests to God. Kings to God. Revelation 5 and verse 10 states the same thing. We are kings and priests to God, and we shall reign in the earth, the Scripture says. Peter takes up this same refrain in the book of 1 Peter, and there he acknowledges that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, kings and priests to God. One of the great proclamations of our exaltation in Christ Jesus is found in the book of Ephesians. Here the Apostle launches into a truth so sacred, so high, so lofty, that one can scarce take it in. He affirms in the book of Ephesians that Jesus Christ has been exalted up into the heavenlies, and not only that, but that believers have been exalted there with Him. Ephesians 1, verse 20, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead, and set Him at His own right hand, and in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under His feet, and gave Him to be the head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all, and you hath He quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Ending with Ephesians 2, verse 1. What is the correlation between Ephesians 2, 1 and Ephesians 1, 20-23? Simply this. God has not only exalted Christ Jesus to His right hand, He has exalted believers with Him. And you hath He quickened or made alive together with Him. We are seated with Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. That is the expressed affirmation of Ephesians 2 and verse 6, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, that's not a metaphor of speech. This has actually occurred. By faith we have been elevated up with Christ, and we are kings and priests to God. The warfare in which we are engaged, external to ourselves, is not one of flesh and blood. We now actually contend with principalities and powers that have been known to detain angelic hosts as high as three weeks, according to the book of Daniel, the seventh chapter. Fierce combat takes place in heavenly places. Paul apprises of this situation, says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. As we contend with these forces, we do so as kings, and priests to God, rulers and reigners. Now, some have interpreted this to mean that we certainly then have no difficulties in this world. We are able to subdue circumstance, they say. We are able to ride on top of the storm at all times, no valleys, no hills, no floods to forge, no fires to pass through. Is this so? Alas, it is not so. The fact that we are kings and priests does not mean everything turns out all right. We are not sailed to glory on beds of ease. We are in the midst of a conflict, a mortal conflict, in which from time to time we lose a skirmish or two, even though we're kings and priests to God. Now let's illustrate this truth with the proclamation 
of the Apostle Paul himself. Here was a man who was a prince in heaven. He was a prince upon earth and more so now. How about it? Did things go well for him? Was he able to be on top of every situation? Let's hear his own testimony, 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, and day and a night I have been in the deep in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things which are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. I ask you, was Paul a king and a priest that had no difficulty, that was automatically able to subdue all adverse circumstances? Indeed not. He suffered the conflicts not only of internal warfare, but of external also. There's another word on this in 2 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, and verse 5. But when we were come into Macedonia... Our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Fears, Paul? You're an apostle and you had fears within? Indeed he did. He was a king, but he wrestled with conflict. You ought not be surprised then if you have conflict, even though you are a king and a priest of God. Well, let's hear it from the words of our blessed Lord, who has reconciled us to God and tasted death for every man. John 16 and verse 33 states, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. How can a person be of good cheer because his master overcame the world when he's experiencing conflict? Well, because you will experience victory over the world with Jesus if you hold on your way. If you're not confused by this conflict, this fierce war, this experience of competitive influences, hold on your way, pilgrim, believer. In the world we will have tribulation, even though we're kings and priests of God. We have not been called a total tranquility here. Rest is yet to come. As the Word of God says, there remains a rest to the people of God, but we're not there yet. Now in our role as kings and priests, there is an area in which we lack controlling power. Our text in Romans, the seventh chapter, has this in consideration. Even though we are kings and priests of God, even though we are strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inward man, and Christ dwells in our heart by faith, and even though the Holy Spirit of God resides in us and our bodies are temples of the Holy Ghost, there is an area of our lives in which we have no vital control. The things that I would not, those things I do, the things I would, those things I do not. These are involuntary eruptions of vileness within. I want to underscore the word involuntary. We don't want them to occur. Our preference is God and Christ and the things of God and purity and holiness, righteousness. That's our preference. But alas, I experience this inward tug of war, involuntary as it is, yet real. This warfare is illogical and it's unreasonable and quite frankly, it's baffling. Because I'm not a hundred percent for God, Paul says, I'm dissatisfied. You see, the first and great commandment is this, never forget it, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, and anybody reconciled to God is discontent with anything less than that. Paul said, I'm not a hundred percent, I want to be, but I'm not. 
I've got thoughts that don't comport with God's will. They simply don't fit in. They're not my preference at all. Uncontrolled doing, mind you, even though he's a king and a priest to God. You see, the blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, who's the pure in heart? People that have no vile thoughts? Indeed not. It's people whose basic heart is pure and where vile thoughts are in intrusion against their basic constitution. Their wills are not defective. Paul said, the thing that I would, that is the thing I want to do, is what I don't seem to get done. And the thing I don't want to do is what I do. So it's not a matter of the will. I really want what's right. Now here, don't present a subterfuge to God. If you really don't want what's right, listen to me, you can receive a heart that will want what's right if you want. But if you're a believer in Christ, if you've obeyed the gospel, I already know your status. You really do want what's right or you'd never made the move. Now that wanter of yours is what God views. And when these intrusions come in, these uncontrolled intrusions, it is not I, Paul said, that sins. What I hate, I find myself doing. This evidence is a basic and fundamental hatred for sin. Heaven recognizes this as a treasure of incalculable worth. No longer do I delight in iniquity once I did. Perhaps once you did too. No more. Sin is distasteful. You see, the ungodly do not hate sin. They only have a stinging conscience, but they really don't hate sin. If you hate it and loathe it and don't want to do it, then you are experiencing Romans, the seventh chapter. The godly have a genuine repugnance for sin. Romans 7, verse 23 puts it in these words, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin and death which is in my members. He does not mean here I just, I murdered someone and I couldn't help it. What he's saying is, I cannot bring a cessation to the fleshly appetite. I cannot stop the flesh from wanting the wrong thing. And I am quite discontent with this condition. Heaven hears such a response and says, I will strengthen and undergird that person with divine might and divine power, because he wants what God wants. He wants what Christ wants. Here in this world, we must continually mortify the deeds of the body. We must continually abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul, and deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Well, such abominations are foolish. If these ungodly lusts do not occur, of course they occur. There are fleshly lusts that war against the soul. There is ungodliness and worldly lusts that must be denied. Things that are vying for your attention, that are intruding into your thought processes. All of this in spite of the fact that you're a king and a priest to God. Now this entire condition defies fleshly explanation. Psychiatrists can't explain it. The earthly counselor cannot delineate it to the satisfaction of your soul. Only God can explain it. The explanation is simply this. This condition exists because of the new creation that you are in Christ Jesus. Part of heaven is now in you, and heaven cannot be reconciled to this world. The world's going to pass away. Heaven's eternal. God's forever. Your flesh is going to die. The two cannot be reconciled, and yet you've got both of them in your constitution. You see, the condition of competition and conflict could not exist if there was not life introduced. Somehow that ought to sound a glad note to a lot of you. The thought that you considered yourself alienated from God and separate from Him. Perhaps you thought you weren't even converted. Maybe you considered yourself not to be a son of God because you had these notions and thoughts that quite frankly didn't square with your commitment to God. It ought to be a glad sound of gospel proclamation to you that God does not count that as the real you. That's an intrusion into you. It's something you cannot control, but don't despair because you can't control it. Lean heavily upon the Lord. Struggle, you see, presumes the existence of life. Where there's no life, there's no struggle. So the day the struggle ceases, you've either died in the body or you've died toward God. 
one or the other. We should not leave this subject without emphasizing that correct values cannot alter this condition. You can't get enough knowledge to dissipate this warfare. A cessation of the war doesn't come by knowledge or knowing the facts in the case. It will only come when you leave this present evil world and are absent from the body and present with the Lord. Now make no mistake about it, it's absolutely necessary to have correct values, and we do not undercut this or underrate this at all. Hebrews 5 and verse 14 speaks about those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. Now there's no substitute for this, none at all. You must learn to separate good and evil and discern it, perceive it, comprehend it, and appropriately select right and reject the wrong. The scriptures teach us that values are absolutely imperative. You'll never be able to run the race to glory without correct values. Hebrews the first chapter and verse 9, speaking of our Lord and also of those who follow Him, said that He loved righteousness and hated iniquity. That's proper values. You can't go to heaven without that. In 1 Peter 3 and verse 11, the Word of God says, Let him learn to eschew evil and do good. Well, you must be able to separate between the two. Your values must be correct. Your value system must be honored in heaven. Concerning values, Peter summons us to alertness. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist, steadfast in the faith. Now you can't stop Satan's activity, and Satan's got your flesh to work with. The only way you can diminish his power is to be sober, alert, vigilant, watchman on the wall, so to speak, not being caught off guard at any time. And when these foreign thoughts intrude into your minds, resist the devil. Say, no, I will not do that. No, I will not fulfill that. And you have a promise from God now on this. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. So if the devil's harassing you in an inordinate manner, now you know why. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. But you can't stop him from coming to you and tempting you. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth, and in so doing you will neutralize Satan's power. You see, Satan is repulsed by the truth like God is repulsed by a lie. You tell a lie to God, and God will leave. God can't tolerate lies. You tell the truth to Satan, and he'll leave. He can't tolerate the truth. You may not be able to stop Satan from approaching you and desiring to sift you as wheat, as Jesus said he wanted Peter, but you can stop him from fulfilling his diabolical desires by resisting him. Uncontrolled doing. While we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, there are sometimes other quests with which we are tempted. Even our Lord Jesus was tempted of Satan to view all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. It was a real temptation, a genuine temptation, but Jesus put it down and resisted it. He couldn't stop Satan from coming to him, but He stopped him from fulfilling His will in him. You can too. You can do it. Yet what I hate occurs, even though, even though I don't want it to, it still occurs. There are imaginations to be cast down. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5 tells us. They come into your mind, your thoughts. They've got to be cast down. Your weaponry in Christ Jesus is adequate for this assignment. There are thoughts that must be taken captive to obedience of Christ. Thoughts that come into your mind that must be subverted and aborted, that you cannot let go any further. These thoughts entering your mind are not something you can stop. It's uncontrolled doing, quite against your will. Now let's consider in closing a few words about the tyranny of law. Law cannot justify. See, Paul is establishing in this seventh chapter of Romans the futility of law to justify and sanctify. Actually, when he looks at the inward warfare, the inner conflict that he has, he's claiming his justification. He's saying, look, I've got a situation here that I cannot control. I've got foreign thoughts that come into my mind, lusts that I don't want to have, but I have been justified by Jesus Christ's blood. I'm not condemned by God because these things are against my will as well as His will. 
The law cannot deal with a forgiven man. You see, the law, the holy law of God, was given that every mouth might be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. But when you come into Christ Jesus, the mouth of the law is stopped. It cannot condemn you anymore, because you've been justified from all those things. Now when the law finds you in agreement with it, it's powerless to condemn you, just as it was powerless to justify you. The law condemned lust. Now, out here in these closing moments, to emphasize to you the value of justification. The law condemned lust. If you had lust, the law condemned it. It provided no remedy for lust. It provided no uh, means to escape condemnation. No strength, no divine resources, no forgiveness under the law, none at all. It condemned lust. Now, Paul said, I've still got this. I've still got things in my mind that serve the flesh. But now, in my spirit, I'm reconciled to God. I hate those things. God doesn't charge them against me anymore. Thank God. I'll tell you, you can have the victory over this. You can have the victory over this. If you've been tempted in your thought processes and are just about ready to succumb and give in to it, listen. If it's uncontrolled doing, if it's something you don't want that's intruded itself into your thought processes, it's not sin, and God will not impute it to you for sin. There are some that would seek to regiment the flesh, to impose upon it rules and regulations. Colossians, the second chapter, verses 20 through 23, speak about this touch not, taste not, handle not. And then Paul adds this proviso. He says, Which are not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. What does that mean? Other versions put it this way, the Revised Standard Version says, They have no value in checking the indulgence of the flesh. The New English Bible says they are of no use at all in combating sensuality. You cannot stop sinning because you should not. You can only stop because you don't want to. Rules and regulations imposed upon the soul will not keep him from sin. Only conformity to the divine image and yielding to God by faith, walking in the Spirit, will stop the expression of sin, but nothing can stop temptation from occurring. Go on your way rejoicing, child of God, and be thankful that uncontrolled doing is not really your undoing.